to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the Apostle Paul said, Even if we or an angel from heaven preach to you any other gospel than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. Galatians chapter 1, verse number 8. Welcome to our special study series as we think about today the subject of angels. Again, the Gospel of Christ program is being brought to you today by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. The members of the Lord's Church would love for you in your local area. We encourage you to stop by and visit the assemblies of the Church of Christ. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to study the Word of God better, they'd love to sit down and discuss that with you. And as always, here at the Gospel of Christ, we want to help you in any way that we can in your study and learning of the Word of God. If you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons, or any of our lessons that we have. We provide those to you free of charge on our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a multiplicity of Bible studies, question and answer studies, correspondence courses that you can do there, as well as a host of articles and study material that you may find useful. Or, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson in DVD or CD form, just fill out a media request form on the website or email us. We'd love to hear back from you in any way that we can help you in God's Word and your study of it. Please let us know. Angels is a very unique and special study in many ways in the New Testament, and they are a very curious topic to many people today. Angels have been the subject of a host of news magazines and, and tabloids and even whole TV shows have been based on the idea of angels. In fact, Time Magazine recently conducted a poll among American adults on the subject of angels and these were the results. 69% believed that angels do exist. 45% said they had a personal guardian angel. 32% claimed they had felt some angelic presence at some time in their life. And so with a lot of thought among people today about angels, we want to direct our attention to what does the Bible say on this subject. And apart from what tabloids and magazines and Hollywood may produce, what does the Word of God really teach? on the subject of angels. Well, first let's kind of get a definition of what we're talking about. Angel is kind of an order of supernatural or heavenly beings whose business it is to act as God's messengers. In fact, the Hebrew and the Greek words have some very unique meanings. The Hebrew word used for angel can mean angel or messenger depending upon the context. Same way with the Greek word. The Greek word can mean either angel or messenger depending on how it's used in that context itself. And so when we talk about angels, we're talking about God's special servants whom He issued to do certain jobs and tasks of which we'll talk about in our study today. Now, what about appearances? of angels in the Bible. One of the ways to help familiarize ourselves with this subject might to be to remind ourselves of certain appearances that occurred in the Bible. The religious world likes to make it out and most photos or drawings that you see kind of carry this idea that angels when we see them they have wings, they've got a harp and they've got a halo. But when you see them in the Bible do they have wings and a harp and a halo then? What would an angel look like if you were to see one? Well, here's what the Bible says. At times, they can't be distinguished from people. Genesis chapter 18, 
verse 2 and verse 16 at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, they just thought they were men. When they came to Abraham, they looked like men. And so sometimes they can't be distinguished from other people in the Bible. Some, but not all, have the ability to fly. Daniel 9 verse 21, Revelation 14 6 describes uh, the idea of flying or moving very fast. And some of the seraphim and cherubim, which were special servants of God, did have wings, but not all. And even those passages where they're described as flying, they're often in very apocalyptic contexts, figurative context there. We know that they were very awesome creatures. Isaiah chapter 6, Ezekiel chapter 1 describes the, the majesty and the power of these beings in, in great detail. Now there are times where they were clothed in white and they did shine. John chapter 20 verse number 12 would be an example of certain angels that did have that appearance, but again, not always. And so what we learn about their appearances in the Bible is they may look like people, they may have certain special qualities, or they may be something so majestic and graceful that we would stand in awe of the actual God Himself who created them. Now, let's talk a little bit about the nature of angels. What do I know about the angels and their nature? Well, we know that angels indeed would be created beings. Colossians 1 verse 16, all things were created by Him and for Him. Uh, notice, for example, Psalm 148. Let me give you an example of how the Bible teaches this principle. Psalm chapter 148 and in verse 2 following has this to say about angels and their unique nature which does prove they are created by our God, the God of all things. The Bible records in verse number 2 of Psalm 148, Praise Him, all angels. Praise Him, all hosts. Verse 5, Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. Who commanded? Who was created? Angels. He commanded their praise. He created them. And so, angels, are they created beings? They indeed absolutely are created beings, and they are immortal beings in some way. Luke chapter 20, I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 36 concerning angels and their nature. Luke chapter 20, listen to what the Bible says in verse number 36. The Bible says, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So we know that the things that we mortals face, death, sickness, things of that nature, these beings don't face, nor can they die anymore. They're like the angels or the sons of God who will be at the resurrection. What else do we know about the nature of angels? Angels are in some ways superior to man in his fleshly mortal state. Hebrews 2 verse 9 says of Jesus, he was, when He became to earth, He was made a little lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor, that He by the grace of God might taste death for every man. And so He was made lower than the angels in some ways. Of course, we know that Christ came in human form and suffered for each and every one of us as a human being. Angels are indeed spirit beings. They're not flesh and blood like we are. Angels as spirit beings are ones who are in subjection to Almighty God. Listen to Hebrews chapter 1. This is one of the blockbuster passages that helps us to understand the true identity and really the purpose God created angels for. Hebrews 1, notice what the Bible will say in verse number 5. To which of the angels did He ever say, You are my son today? I have begotten you. Now look in verse number 7. And of the angels he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now verse 14. Of the angels 
Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? What do I know about angels? They're spirit beings who God created to minister and to serve at His desire. They're God's special servants, often with a unique mission and purpose, ultimately to bring about God's plan of salvation and to realize and understand God's will must always be above theirs. Another unique idea and attribute of angels is they have a certain amount of limited knowledge of the divine plan. Matthew 24 verse 36 illustrates this. Concerning the coming of Christ, His second coming, Jesus said, Of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son, but the Father knows that. And so there were certain things that were limited, like man, also to angels. And so they weren't privy to all divine plan and knowledge. They're limited in certain things as well. Now, another unique attribute of angels is that unlike humans, angels don't marry and they don't procreate as men and women do today. Let me illustrate. Look in Mark chapter 12, and I want you to notice what the Scripture will say. Jesus is here showing that the resurrection is true, that it has happened, and He uses this proof. Mark chapter 12, listen to verse number 25. Jesus said, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. The Jews have this question. This man, who, the woman who had seven husbands in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And Jesus says, none. They're like the angels. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. And so there are certain things that we are so accustomed to that don't even exist for angels and isn't even a part of their nature. Now, we do know this about angels, though. Angels definitely have a free will. They're not robots. They are created beings. They are created to serve and minister to Almighty God. But angels have the free will to choose to do that. Two passages illustrate this. I want you to notice Jude, verse number 6, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he is reserved in everlasting chains of darkness for the judgment of that great day. And so here you've got angels who didn't obey, who didn't stay where God wanted them to stay and do what He wanted them to do. And thus they had the ability to choose to obey God or choose to disobey and suffer the consequences. Another passage, 2 Peter 2 verse 4 says this, for if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people. And he goes on to say, you've got to be careful as well. But here's the point. If God did not spare the angels who sinned, angels are free moral agents. They can choose to do good and serve God they can choose to do evil and become servants of Satan locked in darkness for that great and awful day where God's judgment will be revealed upon them. Now, what else do we know about angels? Angels are also beings that worship God by their very nature. Listen to Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 6. But when He again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship Him. Angels are not at the top. They're not gods. They're under God. They worship. They pay honor and homage to something greater than them. Another example. Revelation 4 and 5, you've got this great throne room scene where God's on the throne and Christ the Lamb is there and the angels fall down and pray our Creator, Almighty God. And so they're under God. And they, by their very nature, worship God as their Creator and the one whom they're amenable to. Now, let's also realize this, for this is indeed something that does occur in our world today. Angels are not to be worshipped by people. 
That's not the way God designed it, and God clearly teaches us that's not the case. Let me give you an example. Revelation 19, verse 10. John has been receiving some magnificent testimonies and, and prophecies from God, revelations from God, and this one is so encouraging to John that I want you to notice what he tries to do. Revelation 19.10, the Bible says of this angel, And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, the angel said to John, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Are angels to be worshipped? The angel here said, get up. Stop doing that. I'm a servant like you. You worship God. Colossians 2 verse 18 of the many vain things that some in that day had gotten caught up in. One was angel worship or the worship of angels. Which again is not at all approved by God. And so we sometimes see images where people are worshiping them or falling down before them. And, and friend, that's not the case. We're not created to worship angels. Angels worship God, and we worship God just as well. Now, as we think about the nature of angels, and as we think about some things that especially relate to maybe some common myths that we hear about angels today, let's take just a moment to address some of those. One of the most common myths has to do with, again, the way angels look. Sometimes, in most every picture you see, all angels will have wings. Friend, did you know that's just very rarely the idea in the Bible? There's only a slight reference to any other angels having wings beside created beings like the cherubim and the seraphim. In Daniel 9.21 and in Revelation 14.6, they are said to fly. And thus implied from that is their ability to do that with wings but again, both of those contexts are figurative and there's a whole host of things that happen in the book of Revelation that were never meant to be taken literal. And so the first idea, myth we want to address is that angels, all angels, have wings. Again, as we've already said, in the Bible, most of the angelic appearances that we read about, they look like men. They weren't a whole lot different than me and you. They took on the form of a man when they came to this earth. Then another myth we want to address is this. Sometimes people teach that we're going to become angels. Someone may say, well, he's an angel or he's going to be an angel. We may understand that they're saying that he's a good person, but sometimes that idea is that we're going to be angels in heaven. Friend, that's just not taught in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, they'll be raised incorruptible. We'll all be changed. What are it going to be like? Philippians 3, 20 and 21. We're going to be transformed into a different body, different state, like unto Christ Himself. The mortal will put on immortality, the, incorrupt, or the corruptible will put on incorruption, but nowhere in the Bible does it say that we're going to become angels after this life. That's a myth that maybe has been promoted but is not taught in the Scripture. Let's address another myth and that is that angels talk to us today. You know, I hear this quite often, whether it be in a song, whether it be in a movie, or whether we're talking to someone about a biblical matter. You know, they may say, well, I saw an angel, or an angel talked to me, or you know, is that really how God speaks to us today? Friends, how does God say He'll speak to man? Here's how. Hebrews 1 verse 1. God, who at various times in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, don't miss this, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. God chose to use His Son to speak His message. That message we now have in the words of the Bible. That message 
is powerful. It has the ability to save. And it's God's final revelation to save man, to get him to heaven and to help him to be everything God wants him to be. Let me give you another illustration. Look in 2 Peter, or notice 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. Here's how God speaks to me. Peter said, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, and both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. And so how does the Bible say God speaks through His Son? through the written word given by the apostles inspired by God and found in the pages of the Bible. Now, what if someone says, well, wait a minute now, an angel spoke to me. Here's what I have to consider. First, I know this is God's message. And secondly, the Bible tells me, do not even believe an angel if its message is different than this book. Listen to Galatians 1 verse 8. Paul said, and he's using this to show the importance of following the gospel. Even if we or an angel from heaven preach to you any other gospel than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. As I've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you've received, let him be accursed. What do I learn from that passage? If the apostle Paul came back, and taught something different. Or if an angel from the very throne of God came to me and taught something that contradicted this book, what should I believe? Paul, the angel, or the Bible? Well, Paul said, believe the Bible. Believe what's been preached and believe what's been written. And so someone may say, well, an angel told me to do this and we open our Bible and that's not there. Who do you believe? The book. Believe the Word of God. Believe the Holy Bible because it is indeed God's final revelation to mankind. There's another idea that we need to discuss, a common myth, and that is the idea of guardian angels. Do we all have some special guardian angel who is watching over us and making sure that nothing bad happens to us? Let me ask you to consider a few things first. If it's the case that we all have some special guardian angel watching over us, then some peoples are better than others. And here's what I mean by that. What about the fella who does walk in front of the car and gets hit? Where was his guardian angel? What about the person who has something drop off a building on him? Are we ready to say their guardian angel didn't do too good? You see, my friend, trusting in that is really trusting in something that the Bible doesn't necessarily teach is the case. Now, where do those ideas come from? Hebrews 1 verse 14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent to minister to those who will receive salvation? And so from this idea, people will say God sent angels and they were sent to minister to us. Wait a minute now. Let's keep that in the context. The gospel God getting His plan out. God working through the ages. God who spoke in various times and various ways through the prophets has now in these last days spoken to us. Talking about God bringing the fulfillment of His ultimate gospel plan to mankind. Did God use angels in that? He absolutely did. They announced the birth of Jesus. They told of coming hope and future. That was the working of the angels then. Am I to imply from Hebrews 1.14 that that's not what's taught. That's not the context. That's not what's being applied. What's being taught is their work throughout history in bringing that salvation and helping in the way God told them to through the ages to us and to Christians who are now living, who have that hope of salvation. Well, let's talk about then another myth that may be popular today. and Again, I think is a really an abuse of a context. Hebrews 13, 2. I want you to notice this context with me. Sometimes people will say, we've got to be careful because we might actually entertain angels today. Listen to Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 2. The context, verse 1, Let brotherly love continue, and do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have unwittingly entertained angels. Now, here's the point. You've got to love one another. Why? 
you've got to entertain strangers because that's how you show love. That's how you create relationships. And remember this, some in entertaining strangers even unwittingly entertained angels. Now, what's the point there? The importance of that context will go all the way back to the time of Abraham when they unwittingly entertained angels and how that, that was such a great event and it showed their love for all mankind. What's the writer saying? The writer's saying, love one another. The writer says, entertain strangers. And the writer uses that example from the Old Testament of entertaining angels to show the importance of putting others before self the special nature of that and how we need to have the closeness and love that God wants us to. Is He trying to say we're going to... That's not even the point. The point is love one another, entertain strangers. This one case example, special case example, shows in a unique way how important that is for God's people to do. And so friend, as we think about angels, let's realize that of all God's created beings, I want you to listen real carefully, of all God's created beings, man is the one God sent His Son to save. Angels is not where my emphasis needs to be. Am I thankful for the work they did in God's plan? Absolutely. But friend, my focus needs not to be so much on angels, but on Christ and on following Him. If we were to put our attention our efforts and our aim into serving Christ above all else. That's what really counts. Jesus asked these two questions. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Friend, your soul is the most important thing you have. And so we ask you today, are you really giving attention to your soul? Have you heard about Christ? Do you really believe in Him? Would you repent of your sin, confess His name before men, and would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins? Let's indeed, as Acts 2.38 teaches, put the emphasis on Christ, His plan of salvation, and not on created beings that we're not to worship. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.